Hello and welcome to Transforming Tomorrow, the podcast from the Pentland Centre for Sustainability and Business here at Lancaster University Management School. I'm Paul Turner. And I'm Professor Jan Bebbington. And we're back with a, another group of episodes, Jan, where I'm told reliably that you will not be mangling the English language, making up words that should not be made up. None at all. All proper words in the proper place and the proper order. You'll be happy. Yes, I, I did speak to some uh, colleagues and friends who were most, most unimpressed about <laughs> the fact that infrastructuring was used by a verb. Some of them have quit using English forever as a result. I don't know what to say. <laughs> So yes, we're here to discuss some new topics and we're going to be discussing something that revolves a little bit around net zero today, Jan. Indeed, and net zero is part of the language that we have as we're addressing global climate change. This is a perfect time to be having a conversation about global climate change ideas and particularly the idea of net zero and how it happens in, in places and in communities because COP28 is on. Now, COP stands for Conference of Parties and it just means uh, a meeting of those people who are party to an international agreement and who have agreed to achieve certain things going forward in time. So this Conference of Parties is the parties to the Paris Agreement, which was signed in 2015. And it's already generating lots of headlines. There's been some good news and there's been some uh, people fighting about whether or not you can still have oil and gas in order to get there. And so we know already it's an area where there's a lot of disagreement, a lot of discussion, and where academic research, and particularly our first guest today, can really help us understand this area. never realised that it stood for Conference of Parties. I will admit that. And you say it relates to the Paris Agreement. Does that mean there's been 28 of them since the Paris Agreement? Or was Paris number, I'm going to say 15? I think it was 15, actually. Well done. Um, so the Conference of Parties have been together since the International Panel on Climate Change has been put together. And then it gets very confusing because there's, of course, COP16, which is the Conference of Parties' um, 16th meeting for biodiversity, which is, is next year. We might hear something about that in a future podcast. So yeah, just a, it's a international relations term. If they were being kind, they would have thought of a different title for that so that we didn't have COP16 following COP28. Yes, that, indeed. That, it's quite confusing, I grant you. Very, very confusing. What isn't confusing is that we do have a guest in the studio with us. So today we're joined by Dr Yekaterina Rint, a lecturer in marketing here at Lancaster University Management School. She's a co-investigator on the iConnect project, which is examining local policy innovation in the context of the UK net zero targets. And I can say, Dan, having spoken to many of them over the past few years, I can tell you she's one of the most popular lecturers that we have among students here, universally described as brilliant and pretty much adored. What can I say? Uh, that seems my experience of Yekaterina as well. Welcome, Yekaterina. Welcome. Thank you for such a generous introduction. I hope to live, live up to these expectations. <laughs> Just about the only person in the room at the moment who can be described as universally adored as well. So there you are. It's, yeah. it's great to have you with us. Thank you. Uh, we mentioned the iConnect uh, project very briefly then. Do you want to just give us an overview of what the iConnect project is? Yes, the iConnect project is um, a collaboration between um, Professor Radka Newton from the um, Department of Entrepreneurship and Strategy and Dr. Miriam Calvo from the Lancaster Institute of Contemporary Arts and myself from the Department of Marketing. And I think that interdisciplinary um, collaboration here already says something about the aim and the, the nature of that project. What we are trying to do is to introduce design into innovation of local policy making. And we have specifically noted that design has been introduced into national policy making. And actually, the UK has been a global leader in this field and has been leading, especially with the introduction of the Policy Lab UK in London about 10 years ago. And it has created multiple milestones at a national level. It has democratized design in policy making. It has created important milestones in recognizing what the benefits of design are. Equally, it has also shown what the challenges are. And it is something that I would consider a work in progress to some degree. But unfortunately, or, or fortunately for our project, we had noticed that there is still some scope for development in how we can use design at a local policy level. And I think this is especially important in light of the fact that it has been reported that every 10th council in the UK is near bankruptcy. And on average, every local council is 33 million, um, predicted to have a 33 million deficit by 2025. So it shows two important issues here. On the one hand, we have grand challenges like the climate change challenge, 
poverty, migration, and others. But in this case, we are particularly looking at the net zero challenge that um, is not only a challenge at the national level, it is actually a global challenge very much as it says. But at the same time, we would expect the local um, policymakers to operationalize that challenge and to do something about it. So we see that there is an imbalance here by placing one of the biggest challenges of our time onto local councils that are maybe some of the most under-equipped, not just budget-wise, but also skills-wise, to do something about it. That's a really fascinating opening. And maybe for our listeners, could you say something about what net zero targets are? And I know that it's a really contested space. So just a sense of what we're trying to achieve when we're, as the UK and other parts of the world, are trying to have net zero Sure. I find net zero fascinating because it is a very short word to summarize a very complex issue. (laughs) So net zero means no longer adding to the total amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. That is probably the easiest way to put it. It was decided under the Paris 2015 agreement um, where there were 197 countries, including the UK, that we should agree to lower our global temperature rises to 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2100. I will not be alive by then, most likely, but hopefully this is going to um, to happen for the planet because obviously we are at this moment at a very critical stage. And this is why I think um, the current governmental controversy around whether there's even scope to extend some of these deadlines to 2035, to, to, to keep it to 2030, have been met with very mixed feelings in the industry, policymakers, as well as citizens and NGOs. We've talked about, mentioned COP28, that's obviously global, national, a lot of the policies you're talking about that have been introduced on the back of all the national groups are at a very large level. So why is it important to consider net zero at a local, regional level? Very good question. I think there are two reasons for that. One is that addressing net zero goals requires often very place sensitive and regionally relevant policies. I think when we talk about net zero, most people associate this with um, probably an issue that should be uh, classified with the Department for the Environment or any policymakers dealing with agriculture, maybe energy, of course, energy um, management. But actually, when we look into the different sectors that need to work together to make net zero happen, we will quickly realize how many different departments and often siloed um, uh, divisions need to work together. Just to mention a few, transport is a very important one. Transport contributes around 25% to the CO2 emissions, and this excludes shipping and aviation. So obviously cars is an important issue, but actually what we have been looking into even more is um, in the context of the Eden Morgan project, how can we encourage sustainable and active transport as a way of traveling or reaching the Eden project. We have been doing this at a fairly local scale because, as I I mentioned, our main aim was to look into how we can help local policymakers deal with these issues. But transport is an important thing. And next to that, it's also obviously environmental and forest management. Um, It's agriculture. It's also health, community and well-being management. And we've discovered as we were discussing the transport topic with many of our stakeholders and trying to visualize what some of their concerns are, what some of their um, ways are of dealing with transport issues, is that there's much more into it than just um, the efficiency of getting from one place to the other. It often influences how we perceive the place where we have arrived at. I don't know if you've reflected maybe on your commute to work. If you had a a good journey to work, you may enjoy your day more, you get off on a better start. If you already were frustrated in traffic, um, it kind of can influence everything from the timing to, to your mood to how stressed you are. So our aim with this project was probably to look at the Eden project as a obviously hopefully a very beneficial project for the region, but also to make sure that the journey to Eden is Eden-like. And at this point, we encountered many challenges to, to making that journey happen. So we were grateful we had the chance to work with our local councils on this. When you looked at the journeys towards where the potential Eden project Morecambe site would be, you looked at the Greenway, you looked at public transport, buses, everything... And you spoke to lots of people, I think you spoke to local businesses, you spoke to students here at the university, you spoke to people who had families visiting. Lots of different views. How do you build different views of different people into this kind of policy advice framework? Because lots of people are going to have lots of different opinions. 
Excellent, yes. Um, and this was actually one of our aims, to bring that diversity into the um, policymaking process. We found that, you know, through... And this is not to say that local policymaking is not trying to do their best. They actually really go beyond um, what many people would probably expect. But it is that the legacy processes, the legacy systems that are in place are typically bound to certain types of evidence that are used to arrive at policy decisions. So we've been very keen to make sure that there is a sensitivity to the place, to the human needs, to um, diversity of expertise and the actual user experience that should be taken into account when making lasting and cross-sectoral decisions. So when we were thinking about some of the ways in which we can bring this back to policymakers, amongst the stakeholders that you have just mentioned, Paul, we also were lucky to have on two of our stakeholder events, local policymakers um, being present. And they have worked on, on the canvas that we have uh, developed and a few other tools. And it was fascinating for me to see that some of them met each other and had conversations about this topic for the first time because they came to our stakeholder workshop. So for me, it, that was an achievement because they we managed to actually achieve a cross-departmental conversation. And that is sometimes what needs to take place first. Another thing that I would like to mention, and I, I'm very proud of this uh, happening at the moment, it is that um, this diversity of evidence and experience. We try to capture this through ethnographic research methods. So we were having videography, photography, visual maps of how this can look like. And we were conscious that only a fraction of policymakers could dedicate time to actually come to our workshops or also our workshops um, that we've done. And the aim was, of course, for this to be useful to policymakers. So we did not just want this to be um, something to be seen by maybe one or two who were especially enthusiastic in supporting our, our project. And equally, our aim in this was not to educate policymakers how they should do their work. This was definitely not the aim. The aim was to help them and empower them with more evidence that lies beyond the conventional spectrum of data that is used in policymaking. We often find that the reports and sometimes the aggregate data that is used are kind of sanitized and optimized for the space of meetings where conversations take place. Our aim was to innovate in this space and, and what we are currently working on is the first of its kind policy immersion space. And this is a space where we are designing an actual physical space in the local council that we hope will be visited by a variety of um, policymakers who are in that building. And it is going to provide an immersion for local policymakers in, into, the, into the topic that is subject to that uh, policy decision. So practic practically speaking, um, this means that we are going to have a room that is furnished with the first-hand photographic evidence, with visual audio evidence. We are currently working on footage that will have cycling and footpath evidence from using a GoPro that will be used hopefully with, um, in conjunction with VR equipment. So ideally what this means is that if we cannot demand of, of our policymakers to dedicate time to um, come to those places to experience them. We will bring that place to them and hopefully what will come from that. And we had some very positive feedback from the kind of conversations around this installation already. It is to um, create a space where they have a conversation starter, but also a immersion into the real life experience of how that um, greenway can look like. Sounds amazing. And this is where I think um, what you said at the opening is that it's a design process. And so oftentimes we kind of think we, we generate knowledge through the same means as before, but you're showing us some really interesting and new bits of knowledge. Now, you said something really quite interesting there that caught my ear. You talked about walk shops. <laughs> I have to say in my accent, I have to be very careful about how I communicate that. Can you tell us something about the walk shops? Sure. The workshops were, to me, a fascinating experience. We decided to do workshops before, because we wanted to capture what it is like to travel between Lancaster and the Eden Morecambe site um, using different ways of active and public transport. So the workshop specifically referred to a group of different personas. We have um, invited different um, stakeholders, but also made sure that they represent different personas who would be likely to walk 
that path in this case. Um, we have replicated this also with cyclists, others using public transport, including the train and the bus. But in this case, the workshop referred to, I think it was about a group of six or seven people walking from, from Lancaster to, to the Eden Morkham site. And what I found fascinating about this is that it was not just walking it and measuring how fast we were and, um, and you know it was not about the optimization of that journey in terms of is there even a footpath and can we use it it was more about capturing what does the experience of walking that path mean for the different people and we were capturing this using a polaroid ca- camera yeah. and a kind of diary sheet where we were logging in what smells we perceived what sounds how it made us feel also capturing different visuals that were relevant to to different people. So in my case, I actually found this fascinating at the start because everything that kind of caught my eye was rather concerning. I remember seeing these posters and I think it's actually still up uh, for a missing person, followed by the knife bin, which is placed under the railway bridge, followed by the site where someone decided to, to end their life. So there's a lot of history and a lot of lived experience on these pathways, including also observing the different kinds of litter. It was fascinating to me how much litter can impact our experience and especially the kind of litter. Some of this indicates substance abuse, others indicates particular other social issues like leaflets to help with gambling addiction. So I just found that we were witness to a lot of social challenges that marked the path to Eden. And at the same time, I felt that at the superficial level, If people were to look at this, oh, we are designing active and sustainable transport options for the Eden Morecambe, it looked more like a tourist attraction. But actually, it was about embedding our research into the community, finding out what issues are important to the community and how can the community have a space in um, contributing to how that policy will look like. Brilliant. And I know that path because I cycle down to Morecambe occasionally on it. So sometimes it does feel a little bit scary, but at the same time, you sometimes see wee ponies off in the, and there's the football ground you go by and whatnot. So it's quite a diverse space. I, I find it fascinating as well that you can see things and it means different things to different people. I, I know that there's graffiti, for instance, that you could see. And some people might look at that and say, oh, that's great. That's very artistic. And some people say, oh, I'm worried about this. Is this an area where we're going to come across roughy who are doing graffiti. So it's all, it's important to have the different people with different perspectives taking part in these workshops because otherwise you get one view of yourself and you don't get the view of the community as a whole. Be- beyond that, though, it's not just looking at what's on the path there, on the cycleway. You need to take into account things such as the facilities that are available. If someone needs to stop, use a toilet, are there actually any toilet facilities? If someone wants to get something to eat, is there actually anywhere nearby where they can go and get a snack? So there's so many different things that you need to consider, aren't there, beyond, like you said, just the path itself? Yes, and I think it's fascinating how, to some degree, our research was very practical in looking at exactly some of these things like signposting and considering, for example, the use of multimodal transport. What we mean with that is that someone might want to plan a journey where, depending on weather or personal health conditions or the company that they're in, maybe if they're traveling with elderly um, visitors, they may want to walk only the first few kilometers of that and then switch to a bus journey and then maybe walk a little bit more or choose to take a complete, completely embrace the, the train journey and then have a multimodal transport back. One of the key things that we discovered is that signposting is an issue, the signposting of facilities, but also the signposting of um, different, you know, how, how far is it to get to certain places. But equally, signposting about what the different sites that we encounter actually are. Um, Jan man- mentioned the, the ponies, and that was obviously one of the most endearing <laughs> things to, to pass on that green path. And there, there's great diversity on that path. And we also passed by uh, quite big industrial site where most of us were not familiar with what it is but we later found out that it has actually fascinating history about the you know what what it used to manufacture and also passing by cemeteries and I just think that there's a lot of potential for creating narratives for different segments of that path and equally making them more user-friendly. I think it is not so much even about um, educating potential visitors about how they can lower the carbon footprint of their um, visit to Morecambe by embracing active and sustainable transport, but by making active and sustainable transport accessible, safe, and something that is emotionally desirable. And by emotionally desirable, I mean, what kind of emotions does 
the, does taking that route elicit? In this case, in, the, in our case, it was very mixed. It ranged from watching the peculiarities of why a knife bin is located there to passing by ponies and um, a lot of uh, very adorable dogs and, you know, watching cyclists excel in their, uh, in their speed. But at the same time, we are aware that the green path was originally designed as a very functional path and it does its job for, for that reason. But considering that Eden is likely to attract a higher visitor traffic, we need to think about how we can manage that traffic in a way that is not going to create a negative experience once they arrive. And particularly as people are coming from further afield, it'd be nice to hear what, what thoughts are evolving about um, coming as a tourist, but maybe not driving all the way into Morecambe. So how are some of those tensions and, and mixed mode travel methods being thought about? Yes, we tried to embrace this by looking into the different personas. So one of the personas was an international member of staff who had grandparents visiting from abroad and how this would um, translate, how that current pathway would influence their experience. We also had um, single females um, walking that pathway or a married couple of dogs. Mm -hmm. And just to say, I think that there is great potential that we found in making that pathway come to life, as in if there are international or national visitors, but from different parts of the UK coming, um, can we think about ways of explaining the history of the place? Are there, is there maybe an opportunity for QR codes or something that will help them to understand what the history of Lancaster is, um, the Millennial Bridge, what the pathway, how long the pathway will, pathway will take, what different sites they will pass by. So I think there is great potential for community contributions and also for considering the wider impact of the net zero agenda. What I mean with that is um, something I've not mentioned before, but um, a very important element of the of meeting the net zero goals is to think about what can we do about forest areas or green lands that are going to help absorb CO2. I believe the UK is at 13% of the area being covered in forest, which is one of the lowest in Europe. And they have tried to address this by annual goals of planting more trees and uh, things like that, which is very welcome. But we are also aware that um, on that green way, there are many opportunities to really capitalize on that investment and think about ways in which we can possibly not just just plant more trees to um, deal with the CO2 emissions, but also find ways that benefits the community, maybe through orchards or ways that educate children and, and the community about different seasons, about locally grown apples, pears, whatever is available in the in the region that is, is local to this place. So from uh, naughty trees on Katie Mason's <laughs> podcast, we're now into tasty trees. So I like tasty trees. I like I tasty that. trees. <laughs> Can a tree be both tasty and naughty at the same time? Probably in different seasons, yeah, quite possibly. So. Yeah. Depending <laughs> upon the weather and its particular mood <laughs> on that day. It seems as well, Yekaterina, that this is driven by what's happening with the Eden Project North, which is a magnificent project, you know, lots of funding in there, hopefully help with a regeneration of Morecambe and the wider area. But it seems that it can be applied to wider policy decisions that are going on. This might shine a light on how issues can be brought to the attention of those p- policymakers within the city council, the county council, in lots of different areas that might not necessarily have any relevant tie-in with either Eden or with Net Zero. Yes, and I think it's hopefully something that is going to be in the plans in the future. Beyond helping our local policymakers in dealing with the active and sustainable transport issue and being able to link it to the net zero agenda, I think our second approach here was to sensitize and introduce local policymakers to the power of design and how we can use design to create more human-centric, sustainable, accessible and inclusive policies. And this is something that is not unique to um, policies around the net zero agenda. It is something that ideally um, should be considered in in multiple policies that are requiring a cross-sectoral approach. And I would say most, probably most issues that come to mind would ideally require a cross-divisional or cross-departmental approach. And it's something that historically has not been a very strong feature of modern bureaucracy. In fact, the, I think one of the main, um, I guess, 
ways that design has been introduced into policy making at a national level and that as i mentioned has created a lot of positive effects was the creation of policy labs and there was this phenomenon of labification where every national government uh, tried to create a lab and then kind of create an experimentation um, mentality around using design in policy and while it's very interesting to to do it this way i think the some of the challenges are that it creates an island of experimentation and an island of innovation, and it allows the actual policy body to almost function as usual. So they have done their part in terms of innovating and giving this to people who know how to innovate, please do this. And if maybe surprisingly, it still had massive impact on how some policies have been designed. But I think the future is to think about the integration of design and having a more immersive and transformative view of how we can use design and policymaking. And our longer term aim is to be able to scale this to other local councils in the UK. I think the other thing that I've really taken from our conversation is the idea of legacy systems. And so quite often we un uncover something and we think, well, that's a bit silly why we're doing that, when that might have been really sensible five, ten years ago or whatever. And so we have a, a good colleague and, and friend of the Pentland Centre called Nick Barter who talks about future normal. And I think that's such a fantastic phrase because it's thinking about what kind of design and what kind of systems will help us navigate across to the future, but also will be entirely normal in the future, whereas at the moment seems a bit odd. And so I think the way that you bring together people's experience of a place, how they'd like the place to be, how they'd like it to be different, really helps on that, that journey to future normal. It's really yeah. inspiring stuff. I would love to add something to this because the, the future normal actually speaks to some of the methodology we have used in our stakeholder workshops and that was around creating four future worlds. It's building on the scenario building uh, methodology and it was around detaching how we envision the future from the current constraints, limitations and legacy systems that we are aware of. And while it takes some time sometimes to encourage policymakers to really embrace it, once they have been through it, they love the idea of having a chance to not be constrained by the linearity of thinking and by optimizing from the current state, but actually be able to imagine a future state and then reverse engineer what would need to happen today to make that happen. I loved the report actually that was created at the very start of it and we will put a link in on the podcast page telling you where you can find all the information on the iConnect project and the report. The four different Lancasters that were imagined, I think it was in 2050 to tie yes. in with the Lancashire 2050 plan. I think there was Lanktopia where everything was wonderful. People were using you know, renewable energy, people were using transport that was sustainable. There were, if you had your own petrol powered car, you were very much frowned upon. And all the way down to Lancastrophe. Lancastrophe. Yes, Lancastrophe. It, yeah. You, you, so whoever made up the word didn't consider how you might have to say it. Lancastrophe. Yes. And th that was where everything had gone wrong. And I think people might have been using horse and carts to get around if they were getting around at all because lots of people just didn't want to travel because it was impractical and there's some wonderful ways of imagining what the normal might be obviously recognise as well that none of these scenarios that were there were going to happen exactly but it was ways of imagining it and it's just some great some, some great way of doing things I loved that you'd done that that you'd asked people to imagine what happens if we do this what happens if we do that if we have Good well-being, good transport, good well-being but bad transport, good transport but bad well-being, or everything's just gone to hell in a handcap. It was, it was great. I loved that. Thank you. I think the futuring, the use of futuring methods really helped us in some radical way to decouple how we think about the future and future policies from relying on historical data sets. And as much as I am a data-driven person, this is part of my research identity, it's part of what I teach, um, I think that we also need to be critical of what historical data sets do in, in that they tend to encourage linearity and they tend to encourage optimizing the path we are on. And to some degree, they encourage path dependency if we are not able to critically delineate what other evidence is needed and what evidence may be useful in future to create different states. When you mentioned the Lancastrophy world, it was actually something memorable from that group when they said that if you don't do anything today, this is where we will actually end up. So to some degree, I think the net zero agenda is very important to help us make sure that we will not end up in a Lancastrophy scenario. 
one thing I will say about one of the negative scenarios was it suggested there would be more travel by hot air balloon, which was in a negative scenario, but I just thought that would be wonderful <laughs> if we could all just travel around in our own little hot air balloons. Sort of Phileas, <laughs> Phileas Fogg <laughs> comes to mind and all of that ha- ha- literature. Having, having seen teams try to set up hot air balloons, it would take you a good extra hour to get ready for work in the morning just to blow up the, uh, the hot air balloon to such an extent that you could go anywhere. That's been wonderful, you, Katarina. That's been a fantastic conversation. Or oh, do you have something else, Jan? I now fully understand why you're universally adored. So yes. pleased to have you yeah. with us. Thank you very much, you, Katarina. We'll be back next week. And uh, next week, we're welcoming uh, Dr. Alan Disqua Cruz, who is the director of our Sense of Family Business here. We'll be discussing lots of issues around family business and sustainability. In the meantime, if you do have any questions you'd like to send to us, please do drop us an email, pentlandcentre at lancaster.ac.uk. Or you can find a form that's on our webpage or wherever you download our podcast. There's a link to a form you can send in. With any feedback, we'd love to hear from you. So until then, I'm Paul Turner. And I'm Professor Jane Babington. Bye.